Today I read this very interesting real estate story that I wanted to share with you guys and I'm not really sure if it's true or just a hypothetical story but honestly it doesn't really matter because the whole point of the story is it kind of highlights two different scenarios for someone that bought during the peak of the home prices and somebody that kind of waited it out until today to see where things are for them and how all of this has turned out so far. Because the results in the end of these two stories are quite surprising and either one of these scenarios may be beneficial depending on your view of things. So the first example is of this guy John who found his dream home, two bedroom, two bathroom townhouse close to his job, has enough space for his family. At first he was hesitant to buy the place but Prices were still rising, and this was back in November of 2021, okay? So he bought the place for $400,000 on a 30-year fixed mortgage, and he put a 20% down payment, and his interest rate was 2.98%. And that brings his monthly mortgage payment to only $1,346 a month, which is very affordable no matter which way you slice it. But then this story goes on to show an example of what happens if John would have waited a year by November 2022 and interest rates were 7% at that point and in order to buy the same place with a 20% down payment now he would be paying about $21.46 a month which is 60% more than his $13.46 a month payment. So the first lesson that this story is trying to tell is because John got in even though prices were high and had an ultra low interest rate it still makes the affordability of his home very good which i agree with that is definitely true and based on all of our recent conversations affordability is definitely the number one problem that's plaguing the housing market right now and what's making it so that most people can't afford to buy a home in today's environment let's take a look at the opposite scenario from carla one of john's friends now carla waited to buy and the price spikes forced her to put her home ownership on hold, but lately Carla is seeing price cuts and hearing stories about the market starting to recover, and now seems like a good time to buy, which I disagree, but I see where Carla can get that idea. So Carla finds a home valued at 400,000. She has good credit and saved for a 20% down payment also, but the monthly payment is a big concern because she's looking at a 6% interest rate, which is twice what John had back in 2021, and she would have to negotiate the price of the home down an additional $95,000 in order to match John's monthly mortgage payment. And that's a cut of almost 25%, and likelihood of the seller accepting an offer like that is probably slim to none. And the first mistake that Carla is making here is buying today and assuming she'll have to pay the full $400,000. Even in areas where prices are still being cut, buyers need to be careful not to buy too quickly. And the reason for that is prices can and should be brought down further with buyers using their leverage as negotiating power to pull prices down as far as possible. You see, the big problem here is that too many buyers are just gung-ho on getting the place right now like we've talked about a million times before and because of that mentality it causes people to make irrational decisions it's almost like a competition right like think of all the people that paid over asking price and outbid people to get a home in the crazy market that we had and it's sometimes about ego just as much as it's about getting the home right people want to get a deal but they also want to be the winner right and i think you're still starting to see a little bit of that right now because rates have come down a little bit and your people are starting to see price cuts so they're like oh let me get back in while i still can but let's look at some things with this carla has more negotiating power than john ever did because the market is in not such a great position right now compared to November of 2021. Now, because Carla had more negotiating power, she was able to buy this property for 350K, unlike John, who got it for 400K. 
but her interest rate is higher, which means her monthly mortgage payment is also going to be higher at $16.79 a month, which is $333 a month higher than John's payment. So right off the bat, everybody's going to say, well, John's winning, right? Because he's paying less per month. He's also going to be paying less in interest over the life of the loan. And John is ahead on this thing. Well, let's look at the whole picture before we determine that. And by the way, these mortgage payments do not include taxes, insurance, or HOA fees or anything like that. We're talking just the principal and interest payments here. But now, since home prices are coming down, and let's say the market drops by the 20% that a lot of experts are calling for, and even I kind of agree that 20% is a pretty reasonable amount that home prices might come down by within a year or so. So that would bring the value of John's house down to 320K. It would be the same for Carla's house, since they're similar houses in similar area, right? So they're both worth 320K now. But because John had to borrow more money to buy that more expensive house, John still owes $310,000 on his mortgage, but the house is only worth $320,000. So that means John only has $10,000 in equity right now. But Carla's house, she only owes $278,000 on her mortgage, even though she bought it with a 6% interest rate because her down payment went further because the home price was lower. So Carla actually still has $42,000 in equity, whereas John only has $10,000. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because a lot of people don't hang on to their homes more than five to seven years on average. If both of them were to sell right now, John would actually have to be coming to the closing table and lose money on the sale of his property. Because since he only has $10,000 in equity, and let's say closing costs to sell a home are roughly 8%, John's closing costs are gonna be about $26,000. But he only has $10,000 in equity. So that means he's gonna have to come to the closing table and pay money, 16 grand, if he were to sell that house today versus if Carla sells her house today, she would actually walk away from the closing with $20,000 in her pocket because she has more equity than John. Now remember guys, this is all just a hypothetical scenario trying to prove who's right and who's wrong in this scenario, but I think there's actually no one right answer. And I'm sure some of you should probably be surprised to hear me say that because this scenario that I just laid out here in the end would show that Carla is going to be ahead in the long run because she paid less for the property. And so therefore she has more to gain in equity when it does go back up in value the longer she keeps the property. Versus John, because he had to pay more for the property, it's gonna take him longer to own the home and home prices will have to go up even higher for him to see a sizable gain in equity. But the advantage that John has is his monthly payment is lower. And also I wanna add that if Carla hangs onto the property for several years and interest rates start to come back down, let's say she's, she can take her 6% interest rate and trade it in for a 4.5% interest rate, well that would bring her monthly payment down to $14.19 a month. And that's really not so much higher than what John is paying at $13.46, but she still got a better deal when she purchased the property. So obviously nobody can go back in time and buy when affordability was better than now because John's story proves that even though prices were high, rates were so low, that it actually made affordability better than today, even if prices come down, which is true. If John follows the status quo, like most people, he doesn't hang on to that house more than five to seven years, and we are going into this transitional period of the housing market where prices are on the downslide. Whenever John goes to sell his house, there's a high probability that he might be actually losing quite a bit of money on this house. He'll be lucky to break even if he sells in seven years, guys, because let's say prices continue to fall for the next few years, and by the time they start recovering, they already fell so much that he might not even have his house back to that $400,000 mark. So that's gonna hurt someone like John a lot more in the long run than someone like Carla. And that's kind of the point I wanted to try to make here, because a lot of people would just they really focus on that low monthly payment. They really want that low monthly payment. And that's understandable because that's a part of your monthly budget, right? But when you're looking at the long-term outlook of real estate values and 
the potential resale value of your home, always paying less for the property is going to benefit you far more than having a lower interest rate in the long run. And this is something I've just been pounding here on the channel time and time again. But this story and scenario just solidifies that statement. And it shows that there are advantages to both of these situations. If the lowest monthly payment is your goal, then you probably don't care what the purchase price is. You just care how low of a rate you're going to get. But that can come back to bite you in the end when it's time to sell. I hope you guys found that part of this video interesting because I thought it was cool to really break down like a real life scenario, whether it's real or not, it doesn't really matter. The point is that there's a lot to be learned from these different interest rate and home payment scenarios that everybody can walk away with a better understanding of why it's probably more important to pay less for a property, especially if you're in real estate for the long run. Like a lot of people tell me, oh yeah, I'm gonna buy this house and hang on it for 10 years or more. Well, you definitely want to be getting it at a lower price then and forget about the interest rate. Interest rates are temporary. Here's another crazy California real estate story for you. The city of San Francisco voted in a law where they're going to tax vacant properties because they want people to fill these empty properties up with tenants. And a bunch of landlords and property owners in San Francisco are getting together and suing the city on this, saying that it's not constitutional. And basically the rules that they, they set with this are that if the property is left vacant for more than 182 days a year, starting in 2024, they're gonna get taxed. And the tax starts at $2,500 for units smaller than 1,000 square feet and up to $5,000 for units over 2,000 square feet. And they escalate every subsequent year a unit is vacant. And they even can adjust it later based on inflation. So really, it's an escalating fine that the city has imposed on property owners that have vacant units and the incentive here is to try to get them to fill it up with a renter or sell it to someone who will but this lawsuit says that the government cannot compel a property owner to rent his or her property to third parties without violating the takings clause of the u.s constitution but the city of san francisco says the voters delivered a clear mandate that it's completely unacceptable to have tens of thousands of vacant properties sitting in our city when we have 4,000 people here living on the street. Now I understand the dilemma that San Francisco's in, especially as someone who's been there before and seen just how many people are on the street there. It is crazy how many people are homeless in San Francisco. But what they fail to address here is, number one, a lot of those people are homeless by choice. There are, a lot of them are drug addicts that are on the street using, there's needles everywhere, and let's just say they're not looking for a place to live, okay? And even the ones that are looking for a place to live, let's say some of them are just in an unfortunate situation. How many of them you guys think can pay $2,000 a month or more for a small studio apartment, especially if you're homeless, you know? You're not gonna qualify based on your credit score, your income. You're not gonna have the credentials to even move into a place to begin with. So I feel like what they're trying to do you know, the heart is in the right place, but it just makes no sense and it's not going to work. The landlords that have these vacant units are making the arguments they should be able to choose to keep their units vacant because sometimes they just want to avoid the burdens imposed by the city on landlords, such as things like rent control, eviction laws, registration and notice requirements, relocation payment requirements, all these things that they try to do to people there. And they also said that some of them are keeping the units vacant on purpose because since rental prices are going down there, if they were to rent it to a new tenant today, they're gonna to be locked into a lower rent with San Francisco's rent control laws. But it looks like corruption will always win in the end because this same group of people tried a similar lawsuit back when San Francisco implemented the eviction moratoriums and a San Francisco Superior Court judge rejected their arguments and upheld the anti-eviction law as a permissible exercise of the city's power to regulate evictions to promote public welfare. So the likelihood of these guys suing in order to get away with not having to pay this tax 
are probably pretty low because it seems like they're always going to rule in favor of the tenants in these areas and it's just one of those things guys like i said i just could not imagine being a landlord in california right now with these type of things happening and of course it's probably not everywhere in california but you're seeing these extreme things happen in places like los angeles and san diego and san francisco now and it makes it very risky to even own any type of property there. You can't even have freedom to use your property how you wish if you want to keep it empty for a while and then just use it for a few months or something. You know, that's not even an option anymore without being taxed. So there you go. And Manhattan is also seeing problems right now. The big issue that they're having from this is they're estimating they're losing about $12.4 billion a year right now in tax revenue because office foot traffic is down and all these people that would normally go to the office are out and about during lunch hour spending money at local restaurants and stores and things like this that they're not doing now that they're working from home they're saying this equates to about on average a manhattan worker spending about forty six hundred dollars less per year in areas near their offices and this is supposedly the largest loss per employee of any U.S. city from the work from home trend. And because now they're getting a lot less tax revenue from this, the concern is that they won't be able to have enough money to maintain the subways and invest in schools and keep the city safe and clean and all these things that are required to keep the city operational. Office occupancy rates are only at 47.5% right now in Manhattan. And it's to the point where the mayor of New York is urging companies with a presence in Manhattan to require their workers to return to the office because this is such a problem. And it's interesting because New Jersey has already done this last year at some point, or they're threatening to take away all the tax benefits that the businesses get there. And now Manhattan is starting to feel the pain from this as well, to the point where they're begging their business owners in the city to bring their employees back to the office as a requirement. And it makes me wonder in places like New York that are seeing issues like this, you know, how long is it gonna take before they really just take matters into their own hands like New Jersey and say, well, you know, if you guys don't require your workers to come back into the office, then, you know, we're going to start taking away all your tax incentives and benefits as well. I'm pretty sure when a city's in a desperate situation like this, the begging is going to turn into a punishment sooner than later if they don't get their way. Here's a few other interesting things that are happening this week. A lot of people have been celebrating that inflation's been going down. But there is something brewing in the background that can actually make inflation start to go back up again that no one's thinking about. And that actually is coming from the supply chain. The problem is that we are now starting to have the exact opposite issue that we had during the pandemic. We had shortages of everything, right? Well, now we have abundance of everything to the point where it's becoming a problem. You know, all this stuff that's shipped in from overseas in the container ships and things like that, once it's here, gets stored in a warehouse until it's ready to hit the retail store shelves, okay? But the problem is the warehouses are full now. They're so full that they're charging 10.6% more to warehouse items this year than they did last year. And basically how this works is these extra charges and extra fees that shipment companies have to pay to store this excess of goods gets passed along to the consumer. And higher prices means higher inflation. So there's that. That's happening now. We also have UPS this week announcing that they plan to do some layoffs in the near future. They want to lay off a bunch of their weekend drivers, which are a bunch of people that work their Tuesday through Saturday shift. And some UPS drivers in New York are already starting to see this happen. So there's another company announcing layoffs. And I remember seeing somebody from the comments saying that they work for UPS and they're seeing how slow things are right now when it comes to shipping things. And I'm telling you guys, they're like the front line people, you know, UPS drivers, mail carriers, FedEx, truck drivers. These people are all on the front lines of being able to see in real time how much the economy is either thriving or slowing down because the more shipment that's going on, the more things are booming. And the less shipment that's going on, the less things are booming. And even my mom works for the post office, guys, and she told me that 
she's seeing packages at her facility going way down. And it's to the point where it actually can affect her pay as well because she gets paid based on volume at the post office. So this has a lot of ripple effects throughout the economy that a lot of people don't think about. When you're starting to see places like FedEx and UPS lay people off, that should be a canary in the coal mine when it comes to this recession. But no one wants to look at that. Everybody wants to just say, it's all fine. Unemployment's at three and a half percent. Inflation has been going down. But we just talked about things right now that can change all that in a flash. Now, since all of this is not really great news, I have a funny story to share with you guys. There's a bus stop over in England, and this bus stop is right next to a sign that points the way to the crematory where they cremate dead bodies when someone passes away and right next to this crematory sign on the bus stop they had an ad for the McCrispy burger right next to the crematorium sign and people are complaining about this and mcdonald's is saying oh we had no idea this was next to the crematory sign we'll take it down and i just thought it was pretty funny to see the McCrispy sandwich sign right next to the crematory because the irony there is just hilarious so <laughs> little joke for you guys at the end to uh brighten up your day. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you click the bell notification down below. YouTube will alert you every time I post a new video. And if you don't want to wait, check out my next one on the screen right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.